So tonight we are going to be talking about kind of a heavy subject, but uh, I think you'll find as we go through this that uh, Remember New that is engaged in the, the fight to end child sex slavery around the world is on a very exciting uh, end of that struggle. We are doing some pretty exciting things and uh, we invite you to join us in what we're doing. So let's, uh, let's talk about what all that looks like, okay? We're going to call the young girl in our story Sunshine. Sunshine is a Vietnamese young girl. She grew up in Cambodia. And she has a younger brother. And her younger brother uh, has been disabled from birth. He's been unable to walk. And as a result of that, her mother has been unable to really work. Uh, she's done a little bit of work out of the home. In fact, uh, she has been cutting string for a, a company uh, to earn a little bit of money, the equivalent of about $1.50 a day in U.S. currency. Uh, her Sunshine's father, she really has no memory of. He left the home when she was really quite young. Her stepfather, as long as she can remember, has been drinking, drunk most of the time. Not a very pleasant childhood for Sunshine. In fact, as a child, she has felt unsafe for most of her growing up years. Pretty frightened. Partially because her father often threatened to sell her for money to pay off her, his debt. He was a gambler. Or to buy more alcohol. So think of it as a young child, stepfather saying, you know, I'm going to sell you because I can get some money for you. That was the environment that Sunshine grew up in. Her family was extremely poor. So she was unable to go to school. Scared, impoverished, uneducated. This was Sunshine's life. Let's call the next young lady Gabby. Gabby grew up in Bolivia. Her mother works as a prostitute. Her mother said that she really never felt like she had a choice to do anything else but grow up as a prostitute. The economics, the cultural pressure, just seemed to force her into that. It was like she had no choice. In fact, she can't remember any other woman in her family being anything else other than a prostitute. Her mother, her, her aunt, everybody kind of just fell into that because they had no education, they had no other source of income. It seemed like that was just how it was in that community for young girls growing up. So after Gabby's birth, she went back to the trade. It was really all that she knew. So as Gabby became a young teenager, she quickly began to feel the social pressure, the sexual pressure to go into that trade also. But she didn't want to do that. In fact, as crazy as it seemed, she felt the pressure from her own mom, from her own family. Are you going to start earning some money now for our family now that you're of age? Think of that. Gabby and her family were caught in an inescapable cycle of poverty, inescapable pressure of social pressure that they could not see a way out of. The injustice of it all seemed to scream at her, but she didn't know what to do. It just seemed inevitable that that was going to be her life. That was Gabby's reality. 
and it's the reality of so many children scattered around the world. Poverty, injustice, social pressure, whether it's through somebody in your family wanting to sell you or whether it's through other means. So I have a question for you. Does God care about the circumstances that these young girls found themselves in? Great question, huh? Two men, two street people, were undetected by the crowd. They were beginning to make a scene and become pretty obnoxious. The crowd was beginning to ridicule them, push them out of the way, get out of here, quit causing a scene. But they were relentless. To these men, these were, these were people that should not have been around because a very important person was in town that day. Get out of our way, shut up and quit bothering this guy was probably something like they were saying. You see, rumors of this traveling teacher, this Jesus, had probably reached Jericho, and, and these men, maybe they had buddies that had been in the crowd, and maybe they had actually been healed. We don't know. But for whatever reason, they felt that this traveling teacher who who they called Lord, Son of David, they felt that he could heal them if they could just get his attention. So they weren't about to let Jesus pass by without somehow getting his attention. So they were relentless. And, and I love the response of Jesus. I love the response of Jesus. We read in scriptures that Jesus had compassion on them. And he reached out and he touched them. And their eyes were healed. Jesus had compassion on them and he touched their eyes. The impact of it were, was immediate and dramatic. They were healed, and they began to follow him. Repeatedly in scriptures, God led the writers to record incidences where we learned that Jesus had compassion on those that were in great need. He saw their need, and he not only saw their need, but he did something about those that were in need. He reached out and he touched hurting people. Jesus responded to the neglected, those that were overlooked, those that were abused, those that were set aside by society, dismissed. He overflowed with love, with compassion, with mercy. You see, those qualities are really at the heart of the gospel. Those qualities are the very heart of God. God spoke through the prophet Isaiah, and he reveals his heart in doing so. Listen to the words from Isaiah chapter 58. He says, I don't want you to just go through the motions and rituals of worshiping me. I want you to free those who are wrongly imprisoned. Lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free and remove the chains that bind people. Share your food with the hungry and give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them. That's the heart of God to those who are in great need. You see, God is concerned with people being right with him and 
He's concerned about the condition of their lives. Let me say that again. God is concerned with people being right with him, and he's concerned about the condition of their lives. Jesus demonstrated this dual concern time and time again in his ministry while he was on earth. And it didn't matter whether they were rich, whether they were accused of extorting money, or whether they were a child in need. Jesus was alert to their need, and he responded out of a heart of compassion to do something to meet that need. If you say you love God, love like God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus challenged his followers over and over again with a radical, expanded understanding of what it meant to follow him. It wasn't about rules and ceremony and rituals. It wasn't about being religious. It was about loving God with all your heart. It was about having compassion with others. It was about taking action to reach others in need. Jesus said, as you go, preach the gospel, preach the kingdom, and heal the sick. Drive out the demons. Cleanse those who have leprosy. Freely you have received, freely give. Jesus taught his followers that they were to be concerned about people being right with him. And, and they were to be concerned about the condition of their lives. Time and time again, Jesus demonstrated this dual concern. Jesus was so concerned about this that he taught his disciples, if you love me, love like me. The disciples learned this and practiced this. So we read in the book of Acts that after the Holy Spirit came and began to live within the disciples that Peter and John went out to the streets and began to share the good news of the resurrected Christ. They were so excited they, they couldn't contain it. And they ended up in the temple and while they were going into the temple, what did they see? A crippled man. And how did they respond? <laughs> they responded exactly like Jesus did. They reached out, and out of a heart of compassion, they touched him. And he was healed. If you love me, love like me. If you love me, love like me. You will have a heart of compassion when the Holy Spirit comes and lives within you. You will touch others out of a heart of compassion. You will act in loving ways when the Holy Spirit comes and lives within you. You will be concerned about others like I am concerned about others. You will meet the desperate needs of those around you when I live within you. That is evidence that you are true followers of me. You love me, love like me. Now, historically, the church has not always gotten this right. It's had a hard time. It's had a hard time demonstrating love and proclaiming love at the same time. But such is our calling. We're called to that dual focus. That's really the calling of the Christian Missionary Alliance. That's the calling of Remember New. To have that dual 
focus of proclamation and demonstration of the heart of God. I'd like for you to watch this video that unpacks a little bit more about who Remember New is and how we go about our ministry. Because we're totally committed to that dual balance. And I think you'll find it interesting as to how we're doing that, particularly in the area of ending child sex slavery. The reality in this world today is that every hour, 137 children are abused for the first time in the sex trade. They're struggling to find work. They don't speak the language. They're disenfranchised. They're non-people. And therefore, no one in authority cares about what happens to them. It's unbelievable how expansive the trade is and how its roots has found its way into every community. Even in North America, there is trafficking happening. When I think about ending this issue of, of trafficking, it's gonna require a sacrifice from all of us. We need to be laser focused on preventing children from ever entering the sex trade. I believe in my heart, God's gonna hold our generation accountable for what we do and don't do in regards to child sex slavery. I was in a seminar in Chiang Mai, Thailand, learning about what was going on all over Asia. And one of the missionaries talked about the fact that they were selling children as young as three years old to be sold as sex slaves, which I had never heard about at that point in my life. And then he showed a picture of this 13-year-old girl named Nu. My childhood was my, like many other children in Cambodia. My family did not have work, so my grandmother had to borrow money to buy food for my family. My grandmother had to pay high interest every day on the money she borrowed. The one common denominator for every child that's in the sex trade is poverty. Children who are impoverished do not have access to good education and ability to earn income for their families and thus it makes them at risk of the sex trade. One day, I saw the lady talking with my grandmother. I knew I might be so. Then the lady took me to a man. He was in the hotel room, and I had to stay with him for three days. I begged the man, please do not do this to me. I asked God to please let me to be the last girl this happened to. When I first heard New's story and the man speaking about her said that she was sold by her grandmother, the moment that he said that, God put on my heart two words, remember New. There were two things he wanted me to do. The first one was to find new and make sure she was gonna be okay and help her. And the second one was to those one million children a year that were being sold. I think God was asking me to do whatever I could do to stop that from happening. And now I see all the children around the world and every name in you. They just happy and just be a kid. Every name in you, they have more hope and they have a skill or can go to school. And 
that is where different you can see how they look and the life they have. Remember New is a multinational organization with a presence in countries around the world. Our main strategy is to develop children's homes where we can take children that are at risk, place them in our home to protect them, and give them the highest level of education that they can achieve. When we go into a village in a foreign country and we start offering scholarships for the impoverished children that are at risk of the sex trade to come live in one of our homes, is that those villages stop selling their children. So literally, we're stopping child sex slavery one village at a time. To be most effective, we take a holistic approach, meeting the child's physical, educational, emotional, and spiritual needs. Many times they come there and they're not used to getting three meals every day and we want to offset that fear for them. We also want to give them the best medical care that they can receive and just give them a safe place to live that goes beyond just the basic human comforts. The educational component to prevention is vital um, to be able to raise them up, uh, give them the opportunities they need, the education, vocation, and, and send them back into their communities as the change makers. To me, that's hope for a community because that's where real change happens on a, on a community scale and then onto a national scale. Emotionally, the children come from families that are struggling to survive. They're not necessarily there to, to be able to love on these kids and to support them in the kinds of emotional ways that they need. So they come to us and perhaps for the first time in their lives they're experiencing a family that offers them love and support and other people that are coming that care about them and consistency and reliability. Those are things that are new to them. The indigenous staff or workers are vital for Remember New because they are from the context that we work with. They know the language, they know the customs, and they know the issues of their own place and how to adequately face them. They are literally indispensable. Because of Remember New and uh, all who support us, we are proud. If you not love kid, you not love God. So love kid and love God. So we say let love read. I love how Remember New breaks the cycle of poverty. This opportunity has been able to help provide for this child's future family, their children, their children's children. Because of New's prayer in the worst moment of her life, for God to use her to prevent children from entering the sex trade, many children have been made safe. And for me, the goal always has to be that no child would be sold into the sex trade. For us to do that, we need people that will sponsor our children and come and work with us to stop this atrocity. With Remember New, we express the love of Jesus with compassion, with love, trying to meet the needs of every child emotionally, physically, spiritually, and do all that we can to make sure that every child is safe. Intervening in their life before their life is devastated by being sold or trafficked. 
A young mother sat begging on the street corner. She was holding her 18-month-old child, and the mother's body was ridden with AIDS. It was obvious that she was in really bad shape. In fact, she was really trying to get some drugs to take away the pain. <clears throat> Who would really look after her daughter when she passed away because she knew that she really didn't have long. She was facing death and she knew it. Her body was telling her that. In a society where sex trafficking was so prolific, those passing by glanced and they knew that this child was, was someone that they could grab, someone that they could have. Will you buy my daughter, she cried, crying out to anybody on the street that would have her, that would pay her money, that would get her some money for drugs to get her by. Will you buy my daughter? One of our Remember New House moms happened to be passing by and heard the cry and, and it struck her deep in her heart, deep in her soul and she knew, she just knew that she had to do something. But she also knew that it would be wrong, it would be so wrong to buy the daughter, even if it was for the right purposes, even, even if it was to spare the daughter, she knew that she could not do that. But she also knew deep in her heart that not this child. This child is not going to be sold. I have to do something. So she prayed to Jesus and she hurried off and she looked for some officials to come and, and to come back and to talk with this mom and to see if there was a way that this mom would relinquish this child to remember new. She found some officials. They came back actually pretty quickly. They began a conversation with this mom and, and sharing what Remember New could potentially do to take this child in and provide a safe place for the child, a, a future for the child. Soon they brought the father into the conversation and after quite some time of discussion, the parents signed legal documents and released this young child into the care of this house mom and into the care of Remember New. The house mom went away with great sadness and yet rejoicing in her heart that this child, this child would not be sold. This child was the youngest child we had taken in at that point in time to one of our Remember New children's homes. A few months later we learned that the mom did pass away. And within the year we learned that the father also had passed away. The, the child would have met a devastating future. The child instead is being nurtured in a loving environment with a staff and with people that are demonstrating the love of God and she's being nurtured and cared for because of Remember New. We know that Christ is pleased as Remember New intervenes in the lives of children before they're sold or trafficked. We interview, intervene in these lives, children or teenagers, whenever we learn of their situation whenever possible, through leads, through referrals, through surveys. We seek to remove them, take them off the market so they will not be sold, to intervene and to care for them, to bring them to a safe place, a place of refuge, if you will, where we provide holistic care for them. Currently, Remember New has 65 such places. 65 children's homes scattered through 12 countries. We're caring for more than 1,300 children currently. And some remarkable news. Since 2007, when we first opened our home, 
Some 90% of the children that we've brought to our homes have come to faith in Christ. And that's in some countries where the conversion rate is like 5 7%. But they've seen the love of Christ demonstrated before them. They have curious questions. Why would, why would you bring me to this home and love me like this? Why, why are you doing this? And we love to answer those questions of curiosity by pointing them to the love of Jesus and unpacking the story of Christ's love for them. And they are drawn to that. But the task ahead is really daunting because there's so many children, so many children that we need to step out and to assist. During our time tonight, statistics would say that 30 more children have been devastated by being sold. We need to do something about that. We cannot just hear information and do nothing about that. I believe God's going to hold us accountable to make a difference in the lives of kids around the world. Today I'm calling you to help us attack this global crisis. There are things that you can do. We need your assistance. All of our kids are only able to stay in our home if financially we have child sponsors. We're only able to build homes if we have the finances to be able to do that. Those of us that work for Remember New are only able to do that if we're financially supported. We raise our own support. There are things that you can do. There are ways in which you could leverage your career and serve. There are ways that you could share your profession and help us with vocational training for the kids. Take short-term teams and, and love on the kids and, and work with our kids in various ways in spiritual development and vacation Bible schools and English second language and teaching them sewing skills and helping with agricultural development and all kinds of things. There are ways that you can assist in developing our ministries and working directly with our kids. Help us end child sex slavery. You can make a difference. We'll call the girl in this story Song. She's a Hmong. She's from a Hmong tribe in northern Thailand. And her father abandoned the family when she was young. Her mother was probably a drug addict and had mental issues, as best we could tell from putting together the story. In fact, her mother at one point attempted to kill one of, the, one of her children by suffocating them. These factors, among others, put Song and her two sisters at risk. So we tried to intervene before something worse happened and, and they were actually sold. We learned of Song and her sisters through a missionary in the area, alerted us to the situation, and, and we began to have conversation and offered a scholarship to Song and to her two sisters. And, and we were able to bring them to one of our children's homes. We were able to get them there before any further situation happened and before uh, they were sold. They're now in a safe growing environment and we're so pleased that they're doing well. In fact, since coming to the home, Song has come to faith in Christ and uh, she's been baptized. Uh, I know this in part because my wife Becky and I have the privilege to be her child, one of her child sponsors. I've had a chance to meet Song on a couple of occasions 
and to bring gifts to her, to send messages of love and let her know that we're praying for her. And over a couple of years to watch her grow. And uh, she's a sweet, she's a sweet young gal, and and uh, I'm so glad that we have a small part in her life, and that Remember New is uh, leaning in to uh, her life and to her sister's lives. You can have the opportunity to be involved in the lives of children like that as well. By stepping up and helping a child, you're really living out what Christ said. You love me, love like me. Your act of care is really received in heaven as if you are clothing Christ, as if you are feeding Christ. The scriptures say that the king himself will say, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For, for I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? Or a stranger and show you hospitality? Or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. And friends, I believe, I believe that one day we're going to stand before God and he's going to say to us, oh, Remember when you did something for one of these children that were at risk? And you took them off the market and kept them from being sold? <laughs> you were doing it as unto me. You were doing it for me. And I was pleased. God is concerned with people being right with Him and and he's concerned about the condition of their lives. Jesus had eyes to see and a heart to respond to the desperate needs of those around him. Individuals like Sunshine. Remember Sunshine? Yeah, well, she's doing really well right now. She's in her late teens. She's worked really hard to catch up on her schooling that she had never had an opportunity to have. In fact, in our Remember New setting, she's now at the top of her class. She has a heart to secure a job and to provide back for her family and to lift them up. She loves her house mom and she's a joy to have in our home. And Gabby, remember Gabby? She looks radically different now. And her self-identity has totally changed. She realizes that she has an identity in Christ and not, not dictated by her society, not dictated by her history. She knows that Christ loves her. And she's graduating from high school this year. In fact, there's only one other high school graduate in her whole community. She's changing the course of her whole community. And we're praying that she will influence other young girls in her community to realize that there is another path. You don't have to repeat history. There is another path. But to be perfectly honest with you, I'm not here tonight to simply inform you of the issue of child sex slavery around the world. I'm really here to call you to action. I'm really here to ask you
to listen to God and to ask, what would God have you to do about what you've heard? I'm calling you to help us tackle the problem of child sex slavery and to join us, to join us in the task of ending child sex slavery through prevention. We need you. We need you. We can't do it without the followers of Christ joining together in this, this crisis, to meet this crisis around the world. Will you make a commitment to sponsor a child? Will you make a commitment to pray for kids at risk around the world? Will you make a commitment to consider how your profession, your education, your resources might play a part in this in some way? At least to pray about it, to consider what you might, how you might play a role in this. Because God is concerned. God is concerned for his people being right with him, and he's concerned about the condition of their lives. So as you love Jesus, I challenge you to live like Jesus and to love like Jesus. I'm going to pray and then we're going to take some Q&A of questions that might have been sparked by our conversation. Okay. Father, we just ask that you would allow us to listen to you and allow you to uh, stir in our hearts uh, the kind of response that you have for us uniquely. And it might be different for each of us uh, personally and individually. So uh, help us to listen well to you and have hearts to respond uh, to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So let me answer questions you might have, anything that maybe has been sparked, anything that may be unclear. Uh, feel free to fire away. First question is always the hardest, right? Yes, sir. Um, if remembering new is about prevention, do yes. the DAs also offer resources to people who are currently in sex labor? No. No, okay. We, uh, there are organizations that work with extraction and those that work with those who have uh, suffered the damage of being in uh, uh, in the sex trade, and we allow those organizations to focus on their mission. We feel like our mission is unique and laser focused on the area of prevention. So uh, it's kind of a unique mission, kind of a, in a sense, a narrow mission, but it, we find, we have feel that if we're able to be laser focused, we can do a better job. Good question. And there are organizations, if you're interested in referrals to some of those other organizations that have the broader mission or have or are doing some of those other things, I'm happy to provide some referrals to anybody that would like those kind of references. There are some really good organizations doing those other things that, that we cooperate with or we refer people to, but that's not our mission. Yes. Don, can you speak a little bit to how the house mothers or the people who live in the homes are chosen? Or yeah. We uh, have a network of people in every country that um, we have a relationship with. They might be pastors, they might be missionaries, they might be just followers of Christ that we have developed a relationship with in a country. And we network with them to help us screen. Um, Followers of Christ that have the qualifications to love kids, to provide for kids, um, and to help us screen to make sure that we get have excellent followers of Christ that are uh, qualified to be house parents. They live with the kids. They live on site with the kids. We have boys' homes and we have girls' homes. And about a little more than 25% of our homes now around the world are boys' homes. Um, there's a growing need for that. So, and obviously, for good reasons, we have separate homes with separate house parents. 
Uh, sometimes they're in close proximity and they do some things together, but they are separate homes with separate leadership. So, yeah, we network through the relationships of pastors, missionaries, followers of Christ, the network, saying, hey, we're going to open a home. Who do you know? Uh, help us screen those folks. Tell us about their character. Tell us about their walk with God. Tell us about their background and experience, those type of things, and to make sure we have really good folks. Yes. Yes. Ma'am? So I'd like to hear questions about the children. So you gave us the example of the one where you brought the shows to come get the girls. Yes. How do you, most of the kids get to your homes, and how do you find them? How do we find our home? How do we find the children? Yeah. Uh, it very, how do we find the children it kind of varies from situation to situation. But let me give you a couple of examples, okay? Um, often by referrals, again by pastors, social workers, missionaries, sometimes by the kids themselves, they will give us a heads up, oh, you need to talk to this family because I know that their kids are really at risk, so we will follow up on that kind of a conversation. But sometimes we are, we just know that in a particular pocket of a, a region or a village or area of, this, of a city, it's high traffic. There's a lot of trafficking going on and we're concerned about that. So we may do a survey in that area of the city or of a school, an entire school. And in doing that, we're looking for answers to the, uh, a set of questions that we have. And depending on the answers to those questions, red flags go up. And we say, oh my goodness, that child may be at risk. And if there are enough red flags to, that go off, then we'll have a follow-up conversation with that child and their family or guardian or whoever's kind of responsible and drill down a little bit more to find out in fact, okay, is this child really at risk or you know, did we get some bad information initially? If we continue to find out that, okay, all the factors are giving us clues that this child might really be at risk of being sold based on the answers to these questions, then we will offer a scholarship to our home. And uh, basically the scholarship is to help come alongside the family and provide education, vocational training, lift the load of uh, burden off the family, help provide what the family probably really wants but will never be able to really provide because of their situation. We don't pay for the child. We don't bribe them. Uh, they sign legal documents giving us the opportunity to care for the child and kind of go that way. But then there are other situations. In Kenya, just since March-ish, uh, a whole different set of circumstances came up as to how we brought in young girls. Uh, we became aware of about 16 young girls that had run away from home to escape female circumcision, which leads to a whole series of tragic situations in their life where after the circumcision takes place, then they are forced into marriage situation that ends in prostitution and, and some horrible series of events in their lives. And these brave young girls had run away. They were hiding in the jungle, hiding in churches, hiding in homes, whatever, to get away. And when we found out about it, we said, we have to provide safety for these girls, or they're going to end up in this cycle that will be horrific for them. So we begin to look for a house parents, begin to open up two homes, because we like, we try not to open up large homes, we try to open up homes of about 10 to 12, and we were kind of over that number, so we were looking for two homes to open up. Well, when we began to do that, suddenly some of the other leaders in the area, some of the other pastors in the area said, oh, we know of other kids that have done this, some other young girls. There ended up being about 43 other young girls that had run away as well for the same reason. And suddenly we were looking for places of safety for about over 60 young girls. So sometimes God just 
God just chooses. <laughs> God just opens the floodgate and says, you need to protect these folks. And we don't have sponsors for all these young girls yet. We don't have homes even opened up for all these girls. Some of them are in just very temporary situations right now. And it's a good thing because we've discovered that we're going to have to change the location from where we had intended on putting these homes because we need to get them to a safer place because some, some of the folks are looking for these girls now. So situations are a little bit different. We, we kind of have some things in our mind that we're looking for, some ways that it takes place, but then God does his thing. God just does his thing. And we try to be sensitive to his leading and, and be nimble, to have a direction, but be nimble. To be as responsive as we can, to take faith-filled risks without being irresponsible. And that's sometimes a balance. Any other questions? Yes. 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 I think so. <laughs> you see. You know, I know until somebody asks me the question, and I begin counting and see if I remember them all. So let's give it a shot. Uh, Philippines, uh, India, uh, Thailand, Cambodia, Myanmar, uh, Kenya, Senegal, Guinea-Bissau, the Gambia, Bolivia, Laos, Uganda, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're considering some other countries right now. We're in dialogue about El Salvador, we're in dialogue about uh, two or three other countries. Yes? Um. I'm wondering from a cultural perspective as well as education of how you're creating this opportunity for young women and young men obviously getting their education. Is there a cultural learning piece for parents or uh, tribal groups that are learning about what you're trying to do and helping them to further understand how they can help their children? Because if it's becoming a Kind of something that's ongoing. We can't obviously always save everyone financially. It's almost impossible. But is there like a cultural learning piece that you're doing with the villages or with the parents that are bringing their children in? I don't think we're doing much in that area at this point. Um, probably be a good thing for us to think more about. Um, here's the deal. We're not even known in the country as Remember New. Uh, when we have the conversation with the parents, none of them know that, hey, by the way, we're doing this to keep your kids from being sold. The village people do not know, hey, we're, we're doing this to keep your kids from being sold into sex slavery. It's probably the village chief or the people in the village are probably as active in that business as anybody else. We're known in Thailand as Help Thailand. We're known in Myanmar as Help Myanmar. Our posture in there is we're, we're here in this country to help children to be good citizens, to lift your children out of poverty, to make a better life for them, and to help them succeed. And all of those things are true. But the backstory is we're in there for far more than that. But we're careful how much, how public we are about the backstory. Because we would not be allowed in some of the countries, or in some of the villages, or in some of the homes, if we unveiled the whole story. So to do some of the education you're talking about would be difficult in some of those contexts. But it, it's 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 worth us giving some thought to. Um, yes. Just piggyback off that a little bit. <clears throat> like with 
compassion and uh, mercy. So, so, so you guys ever partner with a, like when you guys find a high risk community or village, you guys are seeing high poverty rates where you guys might have more risk for trafficking for them to come in and do like development projects to help those communities on that level? Our, uh, n no, but, but here's why. We're laser focused on our mission of helping the kids not transforming communities. And what we are laser focused on is helping the kids gain skills so that as they grow up, they will be the transforming agents as they go back into their communities or have a way out of that. So our vocational training programs are directed to the kids in teaching them skills and giving them a vocation rather than the mission of transforming the community they came from. Otherwise, our focus could be diverted from helping kids be safe to community development. And it's a delicate balance. It would be a worthy cause, it would be a good cause, but it would be a distracting cause for our organization. Now some other organization could have that as their mission, and it would be a worthy mission, but it's not our mission. See what I'm saying? Yep. Well, I'm just wondering, because you guys are all within, you know, Christian Missionary Alliance, Yes. you guys discover them, I mean, yep. is there any connection? Yeah, and officially we're not a CMA, uh, we're not a division of CMA, we're a sister organization to CMA. They love us, uh, we have great relationship with them, but we're not a branch of CMA. A lot of our partner churches are CMA. Uh, John Stumbo, the president of CMA, just spoke at our international gathering in Chiang Mai two weeks ago, so we have a great relationship. Uh, but. Uh, we're not officially a division of Christian Missionary Alliance. So that's the distinguishing arm. They're not the one establishing the strategy for us. We, we partner alongside of them as a sister organization. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, many of the stories that you share are very center around the girls that he has bringing in because obviously in one of these countries they're far valued more than the boys. Mm -hmm. So can you speak on how boys are being brought in or, or what does that look like? Yeah, the same way that I just happened to pull some, some girl stories rather than boy stories sure. for tonight. But uh, yeah, we have boys. Uh, that are in our homes. Uh, like I said, we have between 25 and 30 percent of our homes are boys' homes, and uh, they're they're super fun, energetic boys. You know that uh, some of them are rascals, and uh, they they're doing really well. Um, I was going through an area of uh, Bangkok, and my heart just. It was a very difficult part of Bangkok to go through seeing all the signs, advertising, um, sex clubs and everything directed for, for boys. There's a market out there targeted increasingly for young boys. So we are very, uh, very much trying to rescue young boys as well around the world and we're thankful that we have, uh, we're attentive to that and have boys homes. So, I uh, yeah, just have to be the stories I pulled today, but they're doing really well, yeah. And we have great house parents that are focused on the boys, yeah. Uh, a funny story about it, I just met uh, one of our, uh, in Laos, we have a single uh, man that is running a boys' home, and uh, I just met him uh, two weeks ago, uh, great brother. And he, he, he was doing an interview at the gathering that we were at, and he announced that uh, 
he is getting married soon, and it's going to be really good for the boys' home to have, have a mom in the home, too. So he, he got this big applause, you know. It's pretty cool. Yes? What do you guys tell the kids? Like, what do we tell the kids? Yeah. What do they know? The kids? Well, it depends on their age. Okay. The younger the kid, the less they know. The, as they get into teenage years, they know exactly the whole story, you know, the danger that they were in, and and uh, the whole whole nine yards. Younger kids, you know, you're here because we wanted to provide a, a safe place for you. We wanted to love you. We wanted to provide education for you. Uh, just much, a, a lot like we do with children as they are in our homes, we provide information at the level that is appropriate for them at the age. But then to the parents, all they know is you guys are here for medication, to help them out. Right. When you take the kids they know exactly why they yep. yep. As they grow older. Do, do they get to communicate? When they, if it's safe, if they come from a safe environment, they go home for holidays or for summer breaks. Uh, if they don't come from a safe environment, they will stay at the home. So it kind of depends on their situation, where, what that looks like. I Before I came on staff at Remember You, I was over there with the short-term team, and. And it was very cool uh, to watch. Um, kids were getting ready to go back for a, a summer, a short summer break. And uh, it, was, it happened to be the day they were leaving. And they were having kind of a prayer gathering because the kids were so excited. They, were gonna, they had on their hearts to go back and share about Jesus with their friends. And they were having a prayer time. And... Uh, praying for each other that they would be able to go do that with their friends. And it was generated by the kids themselves. And I thought, this is cool. These kids are on mission to go back and do this. And, and some of the kids weren't leaving. Some of the kids were staying at the home because their situation wasn't good for them to go back. The rest of the kids were leaving, going back to their village, and they were going to be sharing with their family and friends about Jesus. And you know, I don't know the rest of the story because I they weren't I wasn't there when they came back, but I thought this is this is a cool environment. They're getting good spiritual nurturing here and uh, I just kinda of filed that away in my brain and yeah, yes. How long do they stay in the home? Um, we're only ten years old as an organization, so you need to check back on that question. Uh, they don't have an age that they have to leave our homes. And children come in at all different ages. Uh, some of them come in as teenagers. Some of them come in as uh, young children. Uh, sometimes we take in uh, maybe two children from a family, so they're coming in at various ages. But we don't have a, an age that they have to leave. So, so they can stay there for years and years until they open to provide for themselves? Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, we had a, I don't think I told this group, so I, I've spoken two or three times this week, so this isn't good if I already told you. Uh, we had a young girl leave at about 16, 17, I didn't tell you that, did I? Oh, good. Uh, she left uh, and went back to her village. She was the second best educated person in that village. She became the school teacher. Mm -hmm. How cool is that? Yes? So do you guys, when they do leave, do you guys still stay in contact with them? Oh, kind of that's like, an idea. Yeah. So my role with Remember New is called Director of Strategic Initiatives, which means uh, you have an idea, you have a dream, you have a vision. Okay, Don, figure out how to make that happen. So. That's kind of a potpourri of things that end up on my desk and we kind of try to figure that out. One of the things that's in the hmm stage right now is that question. Do we, how do we track these folks? Should we track these folks? Uh, do we need an alumni association? Uh, um, do we need to keep data on these folks so that 10 years from now we can tell their story and 
What about them giving back to our organization or making a contribution in some way, you know, in their culture? Uh, what does that look like? Hmm. I think that one's going to end up on my desk at some point down the road. If you have ideas, let me know. We've thought about maybe a private Facebook page, or I don't know what that might look like. But we're only 10 years old, so we, we have some that have left the home. We have quite a few in college right now. We're scholarshiping, which is pretty cool. But they haven't officially, officially left yet. They're, some of them are out of the home and in college, but we don't consider them quite out yet. I don't know. We're thinking about it. We're thinking about thinking about it. But here's the deal. There are a lot of those kinds of things that we could do that would be good, but we also don't want to take on a lot of things that would be distracting from the front end. Of protecting them and starting homes, making sure the kids are safe, and get all of our attention on vocational training, having this big vocational training program, being known as a vocational training school and, and an alumni association and putting all of our time and effort there and, and then forgetting about the front end of keeping kids safe and starting new homes. See what I mean? So it's a delicate dance. You know, how do we, how do we, how do we sort the, the best from, from the good and make sure that we are laser focused on our original mission? So we're asking those questions and trying to be led of God. And, but my role is kind of starting new ministries, new efforts, and trying to put feet to those visions and make it happen and hand it off or start new people off and mentoring people into the, that role and go off and do something else and keep the burden off the president that should be doing other stuff. And kind of a fun role. Yeah. I can. So on your table, there's a contact sheet, which is basically uh, an opportunity for you to stay in touch with me, stay in touch with the organization, and I would love for you to do that. Also, on the table is my business card, which has our website on it, and uh, my email address and cell phone number. I would love for you to make sure you take uh, one of those cards so we can keep in touch. But if you have on your heart already that you think you'd like to sponsor a child, uh, fill this out, leave it with me, and I'll get back in touch with you and have a conversation. If you feel like you lean in in terms of even staff support to uh, help me do what I do and be a part of my life that way, that would be awesome, awesome. Uh, if you just want to have a conversation or get our newsletter and keep in touch with Remember New that way, there's an opportunity for you to do there. If you just have a question, fill it out on there and leave it and we'll be back in touch. So uh, there's another brochure on the table that kind of helps uh, you understand a little bit about Remember New and sponsorships as well. I'll hang around and uh, answer some questions. We have to be out of here in about 15 minutes, so. Um, oh, we have one last question. Yeah. Yes. Um, you also just donations? Yes. Um, okay. Yeah. So if you're interested in that, you know, talk to me and I'll let you know. But you can do that directly on the website. Uh, website's pretty easy to navigate. You know, just go to do uh, donate and uh, go from there. I think one of the blurbs on there talks about donate, and you can go right to there and make a donation. Yes. Thank you so much for being here.